This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Ten minutes obviously isn't nearly long enough to respond to three such different papers in a way that does their content justice. So instead of trying to engage in detail with the content of each one, what I'm going to do is take the three papers collectively as a starting point for some reflections. And actually they're reflections of my own, which have turned out to be really reflections on in a way some striking things that they don't say. Despite being so very different from each other, there are certain things that are not discussed in all of them. Um, One of the things that I was bringing to my readings of the papers, which I was kindly given, you know, this isn't the first time that I've heard uh, what was what was in them uh, was the memory of a discussion I had with some women's studies master's students back in November when I was teaching a session on literature reviewing and I'd asked the students to prepare by reading as I always do a published review article and in this case it was Samira Kawash's article New Directions in Motherhood Studies which was published in the journal Signs in summer 2011 and I chose it pretty much and mostly because it was the most recent example of a review article in a, f- in a women's studies journal that I could find but also because I knew the topic wasn't of special interest to anyone in the group of students. I found it's easier for students to focus on the mechanics of the scholarly literature review if they're not too passionately engaged with the subject matter but in the event It turned out that they were passionately engaged with the subject matter, that they they had a very strong and in most cases very negative reaction to what they were reading about motherhood studies. And this also reminded me of my own very long history as a feminist. I've been a feminist since um, the end of the 1970s really. And it's like we were playing out, me and the students, debates that have gone on over and over again um, before. I mean, Kawash's actual approach was quite different from the papers we've heard today. She was focusing on American research, she was concentrating particularly on debates in sociology and anthropology, saying very little about psychoanalysis, excluding literature entirely from her scope. And yet, the presuppositions and I think the silences in her piece um, were quite noticeable in today's discussion papers too. And so what I want to do is talk about those silences and what they might tell us about where we are and how the conversation might move on. Um, Claire's paper asked why motherhood is apparently so neglected in literary scholarship when it's clearly a central theme in literature, particularly women's writing. And she tentatively answered that it had something to do with the transition from second to third wave feminism and with the post-feminist drift away from social critique. Now I agree with a lot of what Claire said and I'm also a fan of Angela McRobbie's aftermath though. um, Let's not forget it's a recantation. It's Angela McRobbie saying most of what I've been writing for the past decade I'm now wish to go back on. Um, <laughs> but, but I think with the, the, these conclusions of Claire's, I would say that they allied a much longer history of problems and conflicts among feminists around motherhood. At the level of, it, of everyday interaction, as opposed to high theory, motherhood, in my experience, is as divisive an issue as race, class or sexuality. But whereas in those cases there was a moment when feminists were forced to confront their differences, whether or not they could resolve them. With motherhood, I think the nettle has never fully been grasped in a kind of political analysis way. So both uh, Claire and Roberta referred to one um, conflict among women about motherhood, the so-called mommy wars that pit working against non-working mothers. And currently, you might have noticed there's another very high-profile media debate being conducted, uh, provoked by the appearance in English of Elizabeth Badinter's book criticising so-called intensive or attachment mothering. I see this is, this is on the cover of Time magazine this week. Um, These conflicts among mothers were discussed in Kawash's review article too, but what my students found very problematic about Kawash's take was um, basically her inattention to another kind of conflict between mothers and non-mothers and women who are not mothers. Um, Most of the work Kawash reviewed and indeed most of the work talked about um, today 
uh, really starts from the position that mothers constitute a structurally oppressed and exploited group, then seeks to demonstrate how the oppression works and how it's experienced. Often this focuses on the different kinds of degrees of oppression faced by mothers of different classes, ethnicities, positions in the global economy, single and lesbian mothers, adoptive mothers, and I think, I'm, you know, undeniably this research sheds valuable light on certain aspects of motherhood both as experience and as institution. Yet I also think my students did have a point when they contend that there's another side to the coin. Um, these students are relatively young women, all, so far as I know, non-mothers or not yet mothers. And in their personal experience, motherhood may be all the things that Kawash and the research she cites discuss, but it's also two things that she doesn't so much as mention. One is, um, first of all, that it's an expectation of women which my students apprehend as coercive, in the sense that not wanting to be a mother or not being keenly interested in other women's experiences of motherhood or desire for it is something they feel they are constantly called upon to justify. Second, motherhood is a status which in my students' observation offers women authority, power and material privileges that they feel are not granted to non-mothers. Not only do they see this as theoretically and politically problematic, their experience of it on the ground has produced a more personal set of objections and resentment, which I well remember from when I was a feminist of their age. For instance, some of those who had experience of full-time employment complained that the new right of parents, in practice mainly mothers, to request flexible working arrangements resulted in non-mothers being expected to do more work and work more unsocial hours. They recounted incidents where mothers had taken time off for things like going to a school play without acknowledging the impact this had on colleagues who were not accorded comparable um, privileges. According to the students, the attitude of both their employers and the mothers was that it should be female colleagues in the front line when it came to picking up the slack. For instance, coming in to cover on your day off if, if a mother had an emergency of some sort. And if they weren't always accommodating about that, it was seen as unsisterly. I'm giving you their account, okay? Now, they, these are young feminist women and they're not incapable of seeing that the arrangements they're talking about advance the feminist project of giving social recognition to the work of caring for children and acknowledging that as part of the reality of many or most women's lives. They can also see that it's not any easier for women to advance professionally um, just because of the greater consideration given to their roles as mothers. And I think Roberta gave us a, a pretty good account of why, because it's not about advancing them professionally, it's about economic competitiveness. But at the micro level of social relationships among women, the students do feel that it's the mothers who are powerful and that this dynamic is being maintained and justified through a selective appropriation of feminist discourse. Now this kind of conflict is not a new problem and nor do I think it's only the intergenerational one that Claire mentioned, although I agree that's part of it and probably always will be. I think another part of it, and this is the, m the more theoretical thing that I think needs discussing, is the continuing social fact that mother remains the most intelligible and the least unacceptable status from which women can wield authority and power, and therefore the status from which those who can will often choose to do it. This can be seen as a rational choice in a society which offers no other model of female authority um, with the same historical depth or cultural resonance. But it does set up a structural conflict between the women who can and cannot make that choice. It also has the consequence that any authority claimed by any women risks being perceived as an exercise of maternal power and either evoking resistance to being put in the position of a child or being neutralised, domesticated and rendered politically inconsequential by a particular sort of sentimentality. On the resistance side of the equation, my fellow linguist Judith Baxter has recently shown in research on women managers in FTSE 500 companies that the performance of a maternal persona by women in authority continues to be perceived as a less problematic strategy, both by the women and by those who work with them, than performing other stereotypically powerful personae which might call a woman's femininity into question or, conversely, which would explicitly sexualise her. Obviously, we do have one other model of, of female sort of authority and influence, and that would be the courtesan, but it has its own problems. Um, 
But Baxter also shows that the powerful mother figure still prompts ambivalence and resentment, something also dramatised recently in the film The Iron Lady. I thought that was dramatised quite well in it. Or on the sentimentality side of the equation, an illustration might be the recent political influence of Mumsnet, which on one hand is remarkable, no politician could actually refuse to go and talk to Mumsnet if they were asked, but on the other hand, it seems to be conditional on mumsnetters en enacting the cosy, essentially apolitical subjectivity of a mum. The same mum who the TV advertisers tell us goes to Iceland and does the most important job in the world. It doesn't seem to me a coincidence that the most significant intervention made by Mumsnet in politics arose from a question to Gordon Brown about biscuits. Now, it, what happened after that did suggest that if you can't talk to mums on that level, on, on their level, you're dead in the water politically. But it also suggested that the level was the level of domestic minutiae and not public policy. Now, okay, I found it quite striking in the light of what I've just said that the idea of motherhood as a locus of female power did not feature in any of the three papers, really, that I'm responding to. Um, it, it doesn't fall within the remit of Roberta's paper, be, uh, as she shows very clearly the real policy agenda has little to do with advancing the interests of mothers, let alone those of women as a group. Though I did see in the paper some tendency to conflate those terms, and I don't think, you know, mothers and women are not the same thing. And attentiveness to that, you know, to the conflicts I've been talking about would kind of underline that. But one not, might argue that the issue isn't irrelevant um, to thinking about what a feminist social policy might look look like. Conflict and competition among women would also seem to be a question that psychoanalysis is very well equipped to shed some light on, perhaps especially when it takes the form of non-mothers resenting what they perceive as the greater power of mothers. Um, but Lisa's very lucid presentation suggested that this actually hasn't been a, a central question in recent feminist theorizing, theorizing about the maternal. Um, you know, it's not, it's not about motherhood so much is about you know, maternal subjectivity, so actual mothers. And again, these two things, I think, were getting conflated a lot. Um, Claire's paper similarly discussed the way women's fiction had enabled writers and readers to explore some of the more unsettling aspects of maternal experience, like feelings of anger, alienation, powerlessness, the threat of abjection, all the rest of that. But it seems maternal power is rather less explored. I mean, then at least that wasn't something talked about, which might imply, in, you know, is it even more taboo? Or is it that fiction, with its quality of empathy, actually does favour the exploration of the experience of powerlessness rather than the experience or the desire for power? This network sets out to explore the potential of a cross-disciplinary dialogue for the production of a new discourse on motherhood. And, you know, in the rationale that Jill gave at the beginning, various new developments were, talked to, were mentioned which call for new thinking on the subject, changing demographics and family patterns, mass migration, restructuring of labour markets, the increasing technologisation of reproduction. To this one could add, and people did say something about some of these, the rise and rise of consumerism, though in a context of increasing economic inequality, the commodification of reproductive labour, of care work, in some ways of children themselves, new sources and forms of expertise on parenting, new ways of policing it. Now, these are, are important things to talk about, but I want to end by saying that taking account of new developments is probably only one of the things a new discourse needs to do. It's also important to interrogate the problems associated with older discourses and to consider what gaps might exist in our own developing discourse. Now, I don't mean this as a, a criticism of the papers we heard, because clearly in one short paper nobody can talk about everything. Um, and these, these three among them covered a lot of ground, I thought, very lucidly. But a thing I do think it's important to be aware of and be talking about, because it has been such a perennial problem, both in theory and in practice, is the divisions and conflicts motherhood prompts uh, among mothers, but also among women, and also among feminists seeking a new political understanding. Thank you. Thank you so much.